Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to today's Workshop Wednesday Masterclass, the play and previews with Infiniso Dafia. My name is Rachel Silverman, and I'm the artist workshop producer at New York Theatre Workshop. Um, we are over 150 people together today on Zoom, and we have more streaming on Facebook Live. So welcome to everyone, and we're so happy to have you here. Um, this masterclass is part of New York Theatre Workshop's virtual programming series, which is free and available to anyone in the NYTW community, which is all of you who are here, um, whether it's your first time or your 50th time. Um, we have asked Infiniso to share an organization that is meaningful to her. If you're in the position to do so, we hope you would consider making a donation to the Audre Lorde Project a lesbian, gay, bisexual, two-spirit, trans, and gender non-conforming people of color center for community organizing in NYC, and also to NYTW to support ongoing programming in honor of this class. You'll find the link to donate to both organizations in the chat on Zoom and also in the comments on Facebook Live. So today's masterclass will last around 75 minutes, which will be inclusive of the class and Q&A. When we get to the Q&A portion, if you'd like to submit a written question, you can do so using the Q&A feature on Zoom or the comments on Facebook. Or if you're, uh, if you're with us on Zoom, you can use the raise your hand feature and we'll unmute your microphone so you can ask your question live. So we'll go over that again when we get to the Q&A section. You can also upvote written questions by clicking on the thumbs up button and that way we'll get to see um, what questions are resonating with the most people and we will get to as many of the questions that we can um, while we have the time. So it is my great pleasure to introduce Infiniso Udafia. I'm gonna share a brief bio for her. Infiniso is a first generation Nigerian American storyteller and educator. She is currently a Virginia B. Toolman Foundation's Women's Playwright Commissioning Program recipient at NYTW. Productions of her plays Sojourners, Run Boy Run, Her Portmanteau, and In Old Age have been seen at New York Theatre Workshop, the American Conservatory Theatre, the Playwrights Realm, Magic Theatre, the National Black Theatre, among others. She has also worked as a television writer on Netflix's 13 Reasons Why and Apple's Little America and Pachinko. So, Infiniso, we're so happy to have you here. Why don't you join me? Hello. Hello. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm, <laughs> I'm so happy you're here. I'm going to leave you and I'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Hello, everybody. Okay. A lot of y'all showed up for this. I'm very, I'm very, very thankful that you did. I just want to start out by um, thanking you for coming because I know that there's a lot going on in the world right now. Uh, we are in the middle of a, a pandemic and uh, we're in the middle of like a social movement that really does need to happen. Uh, explosions are literally occurring and I don't know how many trees fell down yesterday. So I, I wanna say thank you all for being here. And also thank you for some who I know uh, were trying to come on June 8th and I was the one who rescheduled. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, thank you for joining me for a playwright in preview. And um, I'm gonna keep this pretty relaxed, kind of informal. And um, you'll see me sometimes looking at my notes because extemporaneous speaking is not always a thing for me. So that if you see my eyes moving, that's what's happening. Um, and I guess we should just jump in with like, what is a preview? Um, but I actually already need to roll back because I do think it's important for you all to know the different parts of a playmaking process. So first of all, and this part's gonna go fast. For those playwrights who might be on this, you're gonna be like rolling your eyes going, I know. But just to make sure everybody has the same base layer of knowledge, I'm gonna run through the different parts of the process. First, you have um, auditions. And uh, first, actually, no, uh, a producing theater is like, we like this play, we like this playwright we're going to invite them into our house and program them in our season. So the first thing is actually being invited on in. Um, and then once the playwright is invited on in, then you start having conversations about who's the director going to be. And once that linchpin person, the director, and the playwright team has been like clinched, then you go on into auditions and designer hirings. This is kind of informal um, because the theater has already signed on to 
to produce the play. And after you have your uh, designer hirings and then your auditions, let's get right into the playmaking process. The first day is usually the meet and greet. This is where the playwright, the director, designers, and cast will meet for the first time in a rehearsal space. Now, you should know that the moment that the producing theater is like, playwright, come on in with this play, and director, come on, work has begun. So you, you know, you'll have like designers who are already starting to think about the play, in those auditions, actors might already have started to kind of look at the play and parse it out a little bit. So that first meet and greet is usually the first time everybody's in the same space together, but it's also, it's not the first time that um, people started working. Um, what happens in this meet and greet is that the designers will actually come in with models and renderings. So you'll have a set designer who might have a model of what the set could look like for the play. And if it's not a model, sometimes it's just a 2D rendering. Um, you'll have costume designers who are like, this is what I think the characters for this play look like, what they're dressing, and how they're morphing across the play. And the, um, the costume designer might talk about uh, the different color palettes for the play and why. Uh, then you'll have the lighting designer who will go through, this is the, the light concept for this show. The sound designer as well. Uh, if you have a composer, if you have a projectionist, everybody is going to meet for the first time, tell the ideas. And then at that first meet and greet, you'll have your first table read too, which is extraordinary for the playwright because they will hear for the first time how the uh, play will sound in the mouths of this cast. Uh, of course, there's gonna be a lot of rehearsal to go, but it's just a good like check-in going, oh, okay, this is how the play sounds on the very first day. Uh, then the next part of the rehearsal process, you're gonna go into table work. So the actors and director are usually, now this is, you know, different processes sometimes, but usually they, have, they won't leave the table for maybe like the first week or so. Uh, they're doing the table work part, which includes dramaturgy. So they will be reading and rereading this play ad infinitum, breaking down every single word, um, doing all of the research that uh, they need to do in order to really understand the play and imbue the play with meaning. So that's really fundamental time for the playwright as it's in this part that they can disseminate information, uh, they can give research if the playwright likes to do that or the dramaturg can give research. You will have really rounded conversations about the play itself. And this for me, and this is where I'm gonna go, caveat for me, is a wonderful place for the playwright to start tackling issues if it's a new play and rewriting if possible, because the next part that happens is the standing up part, the blocking. And this is where you will see uh, actors beginning the facilitation of the performance of the play. They are standing up, most of the time their books in their hands, they are um, following impulses and, uh, and trying to um, see what the shape of this play is in 3D life, moving from table work to standing. And the designers are still at work, even though they're not in the room, like a props master might have filled that space with all the props of the play so that the actors can play in real time. And, you know, it, um, it might be that the props master will give uh, a pot that is important to a scene, right? They're gonna try to make sure that that pot is the same weight, the same size as what happens in the play so that the um, actor can get used to using that. So this blocking time is really important in seeing the physical needs of the play. And also it's a great learning time for the playwright during this because sometimes things change from uh, table work to standing and like unities of time all of a sudden expose themselves as like, wait a minute, if this person leaves right now and they say they're going to the bathroom and that's about two minutes, oh no, there's stage time I have to fill in another kind of way. So uh, it's really important in the next phase of rewriting for the playwright going, does this actually make sense when I stand it up? 
And then after blocking will come stumble through, after stumble through, after stumble through, your designer run. And this is where the designers actually re-enter the space again and uh, see how the blocking and the staging is going and see where their ideas are fitting within the staging. Um, and by this time, the actors are off book. They're in that rehearsal hall. They're feeling really, really good. And you're, the playwright feels comfortable going, I know what my play is. And then comes tech. And tech, <laughs> tech, uh, tech is a monster. It has been a monster for me. Um, Tech is when you move from your rehearsal theater where every where you were doing like the table work and the stumble through to the theater theater where it's actually going to be performed before people. And um, that is when uh, most playwrights will tell you you lose your play because you've just moved environments and everything that is comfortable is now gone. And uh, you usually begin tech with some kind of space through uh, as the uh, actors are getting used to the new space and the, 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 slight, the slightly different demands of this space. And then on top of it, all of your designers are now in the room. And your designers are uh, actually filling in the technical world, all the lights and all the sounds around you. So a lot of the times people will say that tech is not for the playwright. Uh, per se, it is for everyone else to put all of the story filling that needs to be there, uh, the beautiful art that helps propel the story around that story. And then after tech comes the thing that we're really going to talk about a lot, which is previews. And it's actually not after tech, because previews actually happen during that tech most of the time. And a preview is a set of public performances uh, of a theatrical presentation that happen before the actual opening night. And you should know that the purpose of previews is to allow everybody to uh, isolate and know the problems of the play, opportunities for improvement that were not found during rehearsals, and to make adjustments uh, for the playwright to see the play and then also make adjustments to go, okay, what are critics? What, what, are, what, are, what is the audience? They're making adjustments during this preview time. So the preview is actually a living organic time where the 3D structure of the play is um, being uh, actually like created and refined. So usually during previews, because there's a lot of change, you'll see a lot of theaters that like offer lower ticket prices before opening night. So people will flock to that preview. Um, and then they're, they're really wonderful for people who like to understand how the sausage is made. Like I know a lot of people who come to previews and then we'll come to the show at the end of the run. Uh, just to see what was the difference between preview to now when the thing is fully, fully set. Uh, and then after previews have gone on for a while, there is a thing that we'll talk more about called show lock, like when you lock that show and go, no more changes can be made. For everybody's sanity, the change has to stop. Now we are setting it into place and um, the, the show is now the show, no more movement. And this gives the actors an opportunity to breathe. Because as we break this down even further, the actors are doing the Lord's work in this time of previews, especially for a new play. And we'll get into it. And so like that show lock time gives it, um, gives the play not only a second to breathe, but for the actors who are going to be up there night after night to make that play their own. Um, usually, which I forgot to say, um, during preview, uh, during pre I said, oh, I said that previews and tech happen at the same time. So you should know that in the beginning parts of previews, there's still a tech rehearsal that's happening. And tech can be as long as 10, out of, uh, 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 10 hours out of a 12 hour day. So these are long, long days. And so in your beginning part of previews, these actors, the playwright, the entire design crew will rehearse. So just so I make sure I say that really clearly, it could be a Tuesday. They're in for the top part of the day rehearsal. They'll get a two hour break and then run into a preview, just so you know exactly 
um, how much work is going into it. And then after you do enough of those previews, it, you'll lock the show. Usually at that time, rehearsals start to taper off. And what, as rehearsals are starting to taper off and the actors are really starting to feel good about um, a show that is no longer shifting underneath their feet, you're getting into the later part of previews. And that's usually when press and critics are coming in the later part of the preview period. And then after that, you have opening night and everybody breathes a sigh of relief because we did this whole big gargantuan thing that looks like it only took like two hours of time, but as you see from that whole breakdown is a journey of a process. Okay, that is my quick and dirty about the play process. And this is how it's gonna work. So uh, we're gonna focus in specifically on previews and I am gonna be uh, Mfaniso of 2015. Funny so of 2015 was having her first show produced uh, at Playwrights Realm and had no real understanding of any of this and really didn't understand a preview. Funny so of 2020 feels as if she does understand a preview. Um, we'll see what Funny so of 2025 actually says about that later. But right now, this <laughs> Funny so thinks she understands a preview. And there were certain things and certain questions that I wished I had asked of myself in 2015 to maximize the preview process. To um, actually, before even maximize, understand the preview process because I didn't. Uh, and so I guess it's going to be old me talking to the me of now uh, and asking questions of myself to myself. And as you are in the middle of this completely meta conversation, if you have questions about anything, please just be like cataloging that in your mind, because then I'll open it up and you can ask them funny. So of 2020, any question that you want, and I will answer to the best of my ability. Also know that some of the things that I'm about to say are subjective about the preview process. So if you want to um, challenge me on a point that I'm making, please do. And we can have a conversation about it because the thing about theater and playmaking is that no process is exactly the same. So there might be things I don't know that you can help me know. Uh, and then I can tell you what I do know from the experience I have. And you all will have the knowledge that I'm still garnering more experiences. Okay, so now that you kind of know what a preview is and know that I didn't understand it, you should know that Mfaniso of 2015 asks a very simple question. Okay, great, you've given me a preview, but I still don't understand what is that preview for? And Mfaniso of 2020 will answer, um, okay, a preview specifically is for the team so that they can learn with a living, breathing audience about how healthy the play is. Uh, as we've said before, it's in the preview that designers are working these things out and we're working out the technical aspects in real time. So example from Funny Stuff 2015, a sound cue that was great in tech rehearsal was so loud, it almost blew a hearing aid, uh, a patron who has a hearing aid um, hair back, right? So that sound designer will then go take a note of what happened in that preview, understanding the audience and go, oh, the sound is way too loud here. I lose nothing if I turn it down a hair. Uh, and so they will then go into the tech rehearsal the next day and fix that sound cue and then try it out again in the next preview. Or here's another thing, something similar has happened to me in the past where you have um, a rotating wheel on a set, right? Any of us who've seen plays have seen that sometimes a set is rotating around bringing you into different settings and scenarios. Well, that thing is like mechanical, it will break down. And all of a sudden during a preview, you notice that the, the set has broken down at the 115 mark. And so a set designer might go in the next day and work on that and see what it looks like to uh, how, how quick fixes can be made in case that ever happens again in a show, in a, preview, uh, in a, in a show that's not the preview. So uh, early previews from Funny Stuff 2015 are really mostly for the designers to learn, fix, and refine. Um, and Funny Stuff 2015, who's quite selfish, 
and is a playwright who wants to see her work being done the way she wants it to be done will ask, well, what about me? I'm the playwright. Can the preview be about me? And um, Friendly Stove 2020 answers, yeah, yeah, it can, homie, it can. Um, and dear heart, I understand why you're asking these questions, but I also hope that you took the opportunity during table read and blocking rehearsals to make the tectonic rewriting shifts of your play. Because with everything you just heard and everything you are learning, you know that making deep, deep changes in previews is really hard. Like dropping in five new scenes to all of a sudden need to be learned, memorized, blocked, and tacked is a lot to do on third preview. And I'm funny, so if 2015 is like, but can I do that though? Because I did not have any impulse to rewrite until I was surrounded by that audience. I'm a designer too. I am learning too. And now I know what the play needs. And my play needs a completely new ending. And I, of 2020, will go, yeah, yes, actually, you can do that. Because at the end of the day, the integrity of the story is absolutely paramount. And if you are not close to that lock date where everything needs to set into stone, do what you need to do in order to manifest the integrity of your play. The only reason that I am imploring you to try to edit early, if you can, is that actors during previews are tired, designers are not sleeping, directors are fraying, and the law of diminishing returns is real. So if you work hard early, you can give big tectonic shifts. It's easier to do that. The, the, the process is more nimble there. It gets a little bit more brittle as you get into preview. So I want to tell you now, just kind of popping out of form, like a, a, a real life story that I ran into with In Old Age, so you can see how this works. And this was, uh, I believe, In Old Age at Magic Theater. Um, so uh, I'm, I can be a bit of a stubborn playwright, and I like to see what I want to see, right? So what I wrote is what I wrote, which means I am the kind of playwright sometimes that does not move quickly in the beginning parts of the rehearsal process where you want the playwright to move quickly. I wanted to see if my stage business was gonna work. And so I, um, I did not actually do a lot of writing in the early stages. And then all of a sudden, as audience members were coming in and I'm looking at a play that I think in the beginning was like two hours, 15 minutes long. I, I forget how long it was, but it was far too long for a two-hander. Um, and I was watching the audience, not quite certain where to pick up on emotion and, and actual story. All of a sudden, I had to shift that play. And what I did to Patrice Johnson and Ron Canada is out of this world as every single day they are coming in with hacks to the play during previews. So what that meant was they were memorizing in the morning. They were guiding the, the scripts during the tech part of rehearsal, blocking it with a Woye Tempo, who was my director. Then on their break, they were memorizing the play to then put in the changes for the preview. Now, I did weigh it because I was like, oh, this is a lot to do. And I decided that it was important for the play, but I am aware that the quicker I move, the easier it is. So I'm just giving you that as a real world example of what happened. So anybody who saw In Old Age, like the first preview, that's a completely different show by the time you got to opening night. The ending was different. Uh, the sound design felt very different. Actually, even like the stage was different. So um, that's a real world uh, example. Okay, so I'm funny. So if 2015 has another question. So uh, I'm funny. So if 2015, when I was like looking back at myself, is hard headed. She's like, I've been in previews before, and I feel like it's not that hard. Everybody just hunkers down and doing and does it. It's like, there doesn't need to be this many thoughts in my head. And I'm funny, so if 2020 is like, yeah, dear, you were in previews 
for two plays before as an actor. And those plays were A Christmas Carol and Children of Eden. And we need to have a conversation about being in previews for being a new, for being in previews while you're within a new play versus being in previews while you're in an established play. And I do think that this makes previews so different if you're in a new play or if you're in an old, in a, an established play. New plays are a different beast because you are literally cooking them for the first time. There's so many different variables. In this, if it's a world premiere, you are setting the vocabulary for that play. And what is working in your mind when you stand it up and then you expose it to the public might not be what you actually want. That comedic moment that you and the designers were laughing at and tech and dying over and bursting over, might fall flat every night because actually it's a joke that's insider baseball and the common people just common people the theater goers don't actually find it funny but you need a comedic moment that's what's happening inside of a new play nothing has been tried out before so um if you can i'm funny so of 2015 have compassion for the fact that everybody including yourself is learning that nobody actually knows what this thing is fully yet. And that while a preview process, while you were in a Christmas carol was easy peasy, nothing to like think about, it's completely different when you're in a new play because that new play is a living, breathing organism that is trying to grow and nobody knows in which way it's growing yet. So you can't actually bring that kind of feeling into it a little bit more compassion is needed. Um, okay, so this actually happened to him funny so in 2015, where it's like, okay, fine, I'm trying to be compassionate. I'm trying, I understand that it's a new play and I, and I know that I should have edited earlier, um, but I feel as if the entire play is no longer working at all and Previews are technically mine to do things with it. So like, what do I do? And I'm funny, so 2020 says to this playwright, okay, I need you to tear it out. What is the play that you need to see right now? And how close can you get to it without breaking the morale, psyches, et cetera, of everybody around you, including yourself? If you have a problem with the play in total, I wonder if that's anxiety because press might be coming because you feel as if the play isn't as funny in your head as you thought it needed to be. A lot of things, anxiety is a real monster when you're inside of previews. And I assure you that potentially the whole play isn't bad. And you should not shift the entire play during previews. But if you like take a step back and you realize, no, there really are issues with my play. And these are huge things. And I am on fifth preview and I only have like three more left. Then you do have to tear it out and ask yourself, what is, this, what is the best story right now? And I wonder if this is something that maybe people might challenge me on, but like, I do think playwrights do need to have in their mind, myself included, that a play is a growing thing beyond this moment right now as well. And so there are things that you might not tackle inside this show that you will in the next show. So uh, not everything, not the entire show. That might mean a deep rewrite after this production. And that can be a hard pill to swallow, so of 2015, but I guarantee you, you're somewhere in the middle of anxiety and fear and um, stress that's making you feel this way. And if it is not that, then you do have a second production where you can tackle all of that. And here we go into a real life experience. I want to go to magic theater when I did in old age first. And um, I, there, it, for people who know in old age, there are two scenes at the end where in the first drafts of it, I had, um, uh, I had no, uh, there's no talking. It's all spiritual talking uh, through breath and through sight. It's, uh, it's nonverbal. And at magic theater, that kind of fell apart 
And so I edited it. I edited it and made it work. And then I'm sitting there going, I don't think I like this, but I'm too far in the preview process now to uh, completely tackle a structural issue that might be throughout the play. So I sat there and it was really uncomfortable. I sat there within a play that I knew wasn't quite working right for me. And then I went to New York Theater Workshop and I came in with an edit that felt different to me, reverted back to some of the things that I wanted to see because I'm stubborn, but it felt better to me. And then I ran into the same issue at uh, uh, New York Theater Workshop where I'm like, there is a component of like spiritual communication that I wanna isolate, that I am not isolating well. And this is a me problem. So I actually would love to see an old age done again with another rewrite from me going, I'm getting closer and closer and it's not done yet. So uh, I offer that. Um, I'm funny, so if 2015 wants to understand more about the lock, that time where you lock the play. And I, uh, 2020 is like, remember lock is that time where the play cannot shift anymore. And it's a good thing because there needs to be a moment where the actors can lock and breathe and settle into the play because press are coming and that's press come during previous. And I'm funny, so 2015 is like, wait, what? They don't come opening night? They should come opening night when everything is absolutely set. Why don't they come opening night? And I'm funny, so 2020 is like, listen, I don't know why they don't come opening night, but I do know that they come in the later part of previews and that in some big markets, like in New York, where it's like New York Times and regionally, where it's your big regional paper, sometimes it can feel like that matters. Uh, and so those previews, the last part of the previews are actually press nights. And a funny story of 2015 is like, how do I prepare for a press night preview? And a funny story of 2020 is like, first you breathe, because you've done all you can by the time you've reached lock. If you're working though as hard as I know you are, you have done everything you can do. And then after that, go, I, you talk to people, look at what the needs of your play are, which is something that I have learned late. Um, if my play has a lot of like inside black jokes, which my plays do, uh, if my play features a lot of Africans and African Americans, then on press night, talk to the marketing team, talk to the theater about what it is to pack out those houses with the people that you need who understand your play. So press night feels good for you and for the people of whom you wanted to see it. That's what you can do. And then the second thing is you breathe. Uh, reviews are um, really, really important. They do happen during previews where it feels like things are really still kind of gelling. There's nothing that you can do about it except for take care of yourself and your heart space. Um, uh, and then funny stuff 2015 is like, I don't know what else I should know about a preview. What else can you tell me? And I'm funny stuff 2020 says a couple of things. First of all, you should not be afraid as a playwright to uh, be clear. So I need such and such, and I need to see such and such, such as I need to see how uh, the transition between acts one and act two are gonna work before third preview. Um, I need to see that in order to understand how I'm gonna edit in the end. So seeing that earlier is gonna be helpful to everybody. So be clear as much as you can be clear uh, so that um, you can get the work you need done, done. Because preview can feel kind of like an unflexible time. Uh, clarity is your friend and so is directness. And for balance, because preview time can be pretty rigorous and pretty exhausting on everybody, how to say thank you. And this is something that I knew before, but with every play gets more and more um, uh, rooted inside of me. Like gratitude goes a long way. You should not be afraid during a preview to say that was amazing. 
to an actor or a director or a designer. If somebody is leaving it all on the stage or someone directed the hell out of the scene to the point that you are now understanding new things about it that you didn't realize, or if a lighting cue can make you weep, which I've had some lighting designers make me cry with the artistry, um, or a sound design, like if, for the people who know in old age, actually starts to mimic actual language the way you hoped for it to do, which is really hard. If the designers, uh, when the designers, and they almost always are, are working this hard, when the actors are memorizing new pages on a preview day that they have to go out and show to audiences as if nothing just happened, saying thank you from the bottom of you goes a long, long way because you are asking people to do really, really difficult things. And um, directness, clarity, and thank you will get you through to that opening night where you can have a drink and party and like bask in the joy of what you have done that nobody knows that you did. Okay, so um, that's kind of what I had prepared to say to you. And so as we want to now let's open it up to q a so rachel if you want to come back and start opening up the floodgates of i hope they're floodgates of people asking yeah um that was incredible thank you so it was so informative and clear and generous to yourself and to us and so uh i'm gonna open up the q a so anyone who has questions you can either type them into the Q&A box, or um, if you'd rather ask your question live, um, you can uh, click on the raise my hand button and then um, anyone who has their hand raised will unmute you um, and you can ask your question live and we'll do a little bit of both of those. So we'll start with um, a question that's coming in the Q&A feature, um, which is about the role of the director and the dramaturg mm -hmm. in this um, new play process and how much input they contribute um, in the developmental process? Uh, I do think it probably shifts from playwright to playwright. So I'm going to talk about this um, and I'm going to keep it local to me and what I like to see. Um, and then you can take that as you take that. <laughs> um, so for, uh, for me, the role of a dramaturg is um, I'm a researcher myself, so I like to do a lot of my own research. And so uh, a lot of what, what a dramaturg for me is like a lot of a conversation. And I like to have a lot of conversation between my dramaturg and director because my director is gonna be standing things up. So they actually need to have the same amount of knowledge as I do. And I work very well with directors who are dramaturgical and research minded so that we can sit there and have conversations because I write a lot in the gap. So there might be ways in which you're not understanding what I'm writing that I have no intention of clarifying that the director will then have to clarify and the dramaturg will then parse out. And I want that done without subtitles or like crazy explanation pamphlets, right? So I always like to keep in dynamic conversation well before actors are even inside the room. And then once inside the room, I am very, um, I look to my dramaturg to like catch, because by this time they should know me fairly well, to catch spaces where I am not explaining something that needs explanation. To catch, especially since I live in, uh, in my plays, I have one foot in Nigeria, one foot in um, uh, America. Sometimes I have, it's interesting where my blind spots come up. Mm -hmm. dramaturgs and directors will help me with that and so I do actually really look to them and because of that I I, I really like to know who those people are going to be um, in order to like stand that play up so I hope I answered your question and if you have a follow-up just type it in and I'll follow it up great and there's another question here about dramaturgs um, which feels connected which is about how much do you use a dramaturg for research versus sort of discussing the play once it's already when you're in process together and 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 do you use the dramaturg for research i'm pretty rigorous with it i'm doing my own research and i do kind of desire and expect my dramaturgs to also be researching and knowing so like um for a play like run boy run 
I even though Run Boy Run is about Run Boy Run is about the Biafran War, and that Biafran War is uh, Af uh, Africa's first modern war. And even though you don't see a lot of the politics of the war within Run Boy Run, mm -hmm. I know all of them. And then uh, I do want my dramaturg to know all of them too. Uh, so that, because those are the underpinnings of how people are behaving. Those are like telling the story of how, of behavior in my play. And so it's pretty uh, important for me for the dramaturg and director to sit on a bed of knowledge because sometimes I'm not in the room. And if I'm not in the room, somebody has got to be disseminating this information. And then on top of it, the dramaturg be, uh, alongside all the research is like asking me questions. The best, my best dramaturgs ask me questions that make me want to throw things at them going, is this structure <laughs> working for you? And I'm like, yes, it's working for me. And they're like, let's take a look at how you're transitioning here and here. And I'm like, leave me alone. So they're also looking out for the play itself and going, mm -hmm. what is the way in which I'm telling this story and am I doing it the most effectively? So mm -hmm. I do depend a lot of my dramaturgs. Awesome. Um, this is a question that's getting a lot of upvotes. So someone is asking if you could describe the first meeting with a director that you may not know or that you might not know very well yet. I've gotten better with this over time. So um, in the beginning, when I was meeting new directors, I was just so excited. I was so excited because I had never had a production before. And I was like, look at me, I'm about to be off Broadway. You're gonna give me a director? I'm gonna take them, yes. My, <laughs> my instant was just yes. And because the, my plays, already come with research packets from me already mm -hmm. i was kind of like well this is going to be easy uh, and so i onboarded and said yes to a lot that upon further consideration i didn't need to say yes to so when you ask me what my first meetings with directors were they were great mm -hmm. i love them i didn't ask any questions mm -hmm. <laughs> and i ran into trouble later right and so now I have meetings with directors, which might not actually look lovely, mm. um, which are an actual investigative interrogation about process uh, and the way in which they see my play already, like from get without really knowing me. And mm. I use that information in order to screen, to know where I, whether I think that this is a relationship that's gonna grow stagnate or if it's going to become frictive in a way that is not uh, artistic. So I now have worse director meetings as I get older mm. and they are better because of it. Mm -hmm. And you have those meetings sometimes and think like oh this might not be a right fit for what it's meant what I thought it was for but yeah. you hold that in your back pocket for something later. Exactly, exactly. Because there's certain play, uh, certain directors I've met with, I'm like, oh, not this play. Mm -hmm. But I have a cycle of nine. This other one, yeah, but not this play. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. uh, it's also changing. It's changing the logic in my head that a good meeting is all smiles. Yeah. So something that else. takes a lot of time to get to 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 feel confident in that. And it's so true. Yeah. Well, and then speaking of the nine plays, there's a lot of questions about process. And so I wonder if you could talk about how you start a play or do you work on one at a time or are you working on many plays at once? Um, and just what's that process like for you? Um, I am just restarting writing plays. Again, it's been about a year. I uh, I've been in the film and TV world for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm going to talk about what process was like beforehand because I think my process is shifting right now. And I, it might right. be a little harder to talk about what that is. Uh, before, I, I preferred to only generate one play at a time. So I, I could only do it that way. But I could edit up to two plays at a time. So... <laughs> 
in the beginning when I was writing the first play, The Grove, only that play. And then I spent like half a year editing that into something that I thought was wonderful. And while I was editing that, I was working on Sojourners, uh, creating it. So that's how I would toggle it. And it was really helpful because I'm writing a nine part cycle and they're all interconnected. So it always felt good to have a foot in the editing world in another play mm. because I, I am always constantly editing because they're constantly new plays and they're all interconnected. So I have to go forth and like catch continuity errors. Um, also, I am, uh, I think the, the quote is, are you a sparrow or an owl dep depending on when you work? And I, I'm definitely a sparrow. I'm up at four in the morning. My brain shuts down <laughs> around 3 p.m. I really only want to be like watching the Golden Girls or a different world and eating mm -hmm. a snack, you mm -hmm. know? So I, I work really intensely in the morning. And then by the time like it's noon to, to two, I'm like winding down, I'm done for the day. So that's a little insight into my process. Well, so we're like right in the middle of your, of your prime period right now. This is peak brain. <laughs> <laughs> I feel it. I, I feel that we are in peak brain. We're in peak we have someone, we mm -hmm. have a hand raised so we can take a live call okay so this is going to be like a radio call-in um <laughs> so um imutinyan i hope i said your name correctly i'm gonna unmute you and then it's gonna ask you to unmute yourself and let's see if we have you oh hello Okay, I think we got disconnected, but if we, if you want to call back, we'll try that again. Um, but I'm going to go back to the um, Q&A right now. So could you talk about your um, process with working with actors and also having been an actor first before you moved to playwriting? How has that affected your process and the way that you engage with actors now? Um, I... I forgot to say that, so I'm very happy that you brought it up, that my first training was acting, or, or one of my first trainings was acting. And I, it is a tricky balance, because mm -hmm. I, I, for one, know what it is I'm asking them to do. Um, and I know how the, I know that preview process can feel terrible for an actor actually, as like, you're just being shuttled across stage. Um, the whys of things, like why you're being asked to do this random thing over here, all of a sudden, you're not getting the breath of answers anymore because you're in preview mm -hmm. process and everybody can feel a clock. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's, it's always like a, a conversation that I have with myself as I'm like, I am about to give you 20 new pages today, which is what happened within old age at one point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, think, mm -hmm. I think New York Theater Workshop remembers that as mm -hmm. I'm mean, about to give you 20 new pages during a preview process. One that has been really exhausting and then compounded with the fact that I had one actor in both plays that were mm -hmm. happening at New York Theater Workshop. And so what, what has happened is I, in a way that sometimes can feel confronting for certain crew members, because I was an actor, I, I do, I do make, I establish connections with my actors so that they can feel like they know me and I feel like they know them. And so that if at any point they want to rage at me over the 20 pages, they can. Mm -hmm. And I can take it. And it, it's, a, it's, it's a little unorthodox, but I, I, I don't kind of want them floating out there going, this playwright is absolutely outside her mind. Like, and so that when I hand them the 20 pages, I can go, I know that this is a lot. I'm very appreciative for what you're about to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you so, so much. And I, the play really, really needs it. And I, and I know it's a lot. Mm -hmm. so at least at, at least it can feel human 
Mm -hmm. So that's what I've done. Um, I don't know if it always works, but I try for it. Yeah. Um, okay, we have another hand raised, so we're going to try this again. We're okay. Gonna try again. Okay. Um, this is for Rudy Bamanga. I'm going to unmute you. Hi, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. It's awesome. Uh, thank you so much uh, for, for this and for this opportunity. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, uh, as you, as you walk across the line of telling African storylines for a predominantly American audience, how do you handle the, the I guess, the question or sometimes the, the struggle of, of being authentic to the story while trying to welcome the audience as opposed to accidentally excluding them? That, that is, oh yeah, oh yeah, mm -hmm. that is the question of my life. Um, when I write my plays, I don't actually think about whether an audience is going to understand them, which mm -hmm. is very uh, different than some playwrights. A lot of playwrights who I know and respect very well, who do have those thoughts in their head. And it's not like it's not a valid thought. It's just one that I, it, it, um, it stunts my writing and blunts it in a way that I don't like when I consider it in the writing. So I don't. And then it means that my director has become more and more and more important because my director and sometimes my dramaturg as well will ask me questions of like, nobody, what, what, do, we, what do we do when nobody understands this? Mm. And those questions then in safe space, I get to interrogate. And a lot of the time in my interrogation, I'm like, whoop. I don't, I'm not changing that. Uh, I don't usually change uh, that kind of stuff. And so then it'll be, um, okay. Then the dramaturg usually comes back to me going, well, do you want people to infer in that space if you're not gonna clarify that space? Mm -hmm. And when I get questions like that, then I might not change the way in which I, I wrote it, but just add a little soft scaffolding that lets you not infer the thing I don't want you to infer <laughs> without necessarily clarifying something that I don't want super clear. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it becomes a real dynamic conversation behind the scenes where I'm always kind of uh, pushing up against what integrity is and then there are certain places where like it happened once going like we think you should explain compound culture and i'm like no one of my characters is going to explain compound culture because they grew up on a compound and they're talking to other people who know what a compound is right so i'm not going to do that kind of uh, explana uh explanation and everybody gets to infer and here's what i here's what i say to myself actually to make this super clear um, I, when I was young, I went to Shakespeare a lot, plays, and I didn't understand Nary, I understood Nary a thing. I didn't. But I had to lean in and fall into somebody else's culture for a second and get something. I'm simply asking people to do the same with me. I am interested in that space. And I will actually hold the questions behind the scenes and the ones that I think that are important to storytelling. I will um, assimilate, and most of them I leave behind. Oh, that's amazing. Thank you so much. That more than answers my question. Thank you, Rudy. Um, great. I'm going to pull another from the Q&A. Um, saying on the theme of uh, um, questions and clarity. This is a question about who you want to take notes from during a preview process. And it's specifically asking about the producing theater's artistic staff. Um, do you want notes? Do you want people to be hands off? And, and who are you interested in getting notes from as you're going through that process? Ah, uh, that's a great, great question. 
uh, because in the preview process, notes are flying around willy nilly everywhere, mm -hmm. <laughs> coming from everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so I do, I, I actually, what I do is I have really good friends of mine, first and foremost, who know me, who are artists in their own right, who I have relationships with usually beyond the theater, come and give me notes by coming to first, first or second preview. So mm -hmm. I do that for myself too, just so that I'm not uh, very like a, I have um, content, uh, a history in note giving. Like there are people who follow me who I adore and love who will come and be like, okay, here are my notes. And I take those very, very seriously. Like there are some friends who have been there from the first iteration of the Grove when I was calling it another name. I know what I've been doing and why, and they're also artists and they give me notes. And so I take those. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I, uh, I am pretty, because of how I am lately with directors and dramaturgs, and specifically like the last process, I would take notes from Awoye Tempo, Loretta Greco. And uh, I, I would take notes from my dramaturgs who have a tendency either to be Catherine Kovner, Janice Perrin. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I do take notes from them, but they also have a long history with me. Mm -hmm. They have a long history with me. Um, and so I know for myself, at, I take notes better if people have known me over time. Mm -hmm. so it's much better to have those people in the room. It's, mm -hmm. harder. it's harder for me to take a note when I just met you and you're like, why don't you fix this? I'm like, why don't you leave? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you. <laughs> so <laughs> I do, I do. I have a very strong, mm -mm, mm -mm. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Well, that feels tied to some other questions about how about building these relationships and mm -hmm. particularly building relationships with theaters. And um, at the beginning of that process, how, how have you built relationships with theaters? What kinds of questions do you ask? How do you sort of suss out if that's a good relationship for you? Um, it, it's, it's actually kind of slow, like Playwrights Realm, Magic Theater, New York Theater Workshop, which have been some of my primary um, homes, uh, there was actually reading processes and workshop mm -hmm. processes that happened before mm -hmm. when I was learning about the theater. And I do take that time very seriously. Mm -hmm. um, like for Playwrights Realm, it was a pipeline for nine months. And I got to know Catherine and we got to know each other. And so a lot of trust and building happens there. I will say that a lot of the theaters that my work keeps tracking back to, there was a big prelim part. And for New York Theater Workshop, I, I'm just gonna be very candid. What happened was um, they saw like a uh, Jim Nicola, uh, the artistic team saw my play at Playwrights Realm. And then the entire team sort of rolled over. And so it was a learning process through that as I also was like within like something that I knew. And then I was like, oh, right, New York Theater Workshop, I understand. But most, most of the time, I have a lot of lead time in, in terms of learning the theater mm. to establish that trust. Yeah. Um, we have some more hands raised. Yeah. So... Carl Green has his hand raised. Hey, Carl! <laughs> I'm gonna unmute you. Hi, hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah, yeah. I can hear hi, you. Carl. So uh, I have a question. So you said you started out as an actor. I'm curious how you entered into the field realm of playwriting and then writing for television and film. Um. I did start as an actor. I was out, I got, um, I graduated ACT with my master's in acting in 2009. And I couldn't really get work because if you remember 2009, that's like the heart of the Great Recession. Nobody's buying and or doing anything. Mm -hmm. And so I started writing and the writing sort of took off under my feet. I don't know that I actually had an intention though to be like, I am going to be a writer, I was trying to understand my world and what was happening to me right now. Like the Grove is the closest thing out of the nine plays to an autobiographical play. It's the closest. Um, and so uh, 
that took off as like my partner at the time and people around me were like reading it and going, this was really, really good. But in my mind, I didn't know that that was a viable career path. Um, and so the transition, it almost felt like a universe union more than me going out and going, this is the thing I'm gonna snatch and do right now. Um, but I will also say that at the time as an actor, I was frustrated. Um, I couldn't get work because of the recession. Um, I was never African enough to be uh, an African in a, in a play, it felt like. Uh, I was always, because of my look, uh, there was a desire to make me a, whatever the sassy black girl stereotype is when I'm like, I sing opera, I need to be playing that ingenue person, actually, uh, whatever that, whatever these words are. So I had, I was having a tricky, tricky time also in acting going, I didn't fit the mold. And so when I did start writing, even though in my head, I hadn't clicked that I, I was going to be a writer, I started writing Africans, African Americans, certain kind of people that I thought were like invisible the way I wanted to see them. You know, I started writing their stories. And then that, by the time I wrote my second play, had become like a codified mission for me. But it didn't start out that way. I didn't like wake up and go, this is the masterpiece that I'm going to do. No, not at all. Uh, and then interestingly, as uh, the community around me is starting to go, these plays are really good. It was a lot of people like coming in and going like, no, I like it. My friends going, no, go forward. And like pushing me forward that all of a sudden my playwriting career is taking off. And then as it takes off, of course, then managers and um, uh, agent teams fill out. And then that's when TV writing started. And TV writing is far more opaque it's a little harder to permeate than I, um, theater writing is. It did feel like I got my job as a TV writer based on who I was as a playwright, which means I don't actually even know how to talk to you about what knocking down that door is. It's a little harder. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then I started after my, after 13 Reasons Why, I started asking myself what kind of shows I wanna be on in the same way I was like, what kind of plays do I want to do? And then that start, I'm starting to refine for the first time now, like exactly what, who do I want to be as a TV artist? I hope that answers your question, Carl. Yes, 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 thank you. Mm -hmm. Amazing. We have a lot of questions on collaboration and how you navigate conflict in collaboration. Mm -hmm. And some of that uh, applies to a director, if a director wants to make a change that you don't agree with, or how do you handle any sort of disagreements in previews with actors or with designers? And wonder if you could speak to that. That's a real thing. Those are, um, and I don't know that I'm good at it. Uh, what I have learned, and it's kind of what I was trying to allude to in my talk, is that uh, clarity, directness is mm -hmm. my friend, actually. Uh, and that everything can be said on a bed of love. Like I, I am no longer at a place where I'm like going after somebody's spirit in order to like get what I need. But I will say, and I have actually said, I need to see my ending the way that I wrote my ending, period. And that needs to happen because this is the play. It's a new play. It's my new play. And I need to see the story manifested the way the story needs to be manifested. Mm -hmm. And there have been also times with actors where I've been like, I can hear the dialect work is not right. And I love you, bro. <laughs> dialect needs to get better now and not so many pauses like there there are i i am not afraid in the way i was in 2015 i'm not afraid of confrontation but what i do make sure is that i am um i am offering that 
that not on a bed of loathing and hatred and bitterness, that it is all for the major good of the play. I try not to be, uh, not to let too much of my ego get involved, which means sometimes I have my venting sessions with my friends and then I come back in the next day and I'm like, this is what is needed, mm. clearly. So um, there is always going to be friction in collaboration and not all of it is bad because when the reason why people are pushing on me is because they are also feeling something. So we actually need to go through that in order to get to the other end. Mm -hmm. And my impulse and your impulse, if you're a director, dramaturg, lighting designer, they're all sourced in ourselves. So I, I, am, I am always going, what does the play need? What does the play need? What does the, this is what I think the play needs. This is what you think the play needs. We're about to have a fight right now. And that is okay. Mm -hmm. So um, that's what I offer. And, um, and then always asking yourself, is this the play? Is, is this the play? Is this the play? Mm -hmm. Everything has to root back to the play. Great. Do you think we have time for one more? What time is it? Yeah. 11.09. Well, we have a live, we have one more hand raised. So maybe we'll take our Last question from a live person, um, Ime Rubin. I'm going to unmute you. Are you with us? Hello. Yes. Yes. Hi. 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 So um, I'll go through really quick on how I came about your work. Um, so my friend Carl, <laughs> who's here. <laughs> Hi, Carl. <laughs> Carl, um, we went to NYU together, and he sent me a screenshot asking me how to say Utsikan, mm -hmm. and I was very shocked because um, it was a Nigerian role, but most Nigerian roles are Yoruba or they're Igbo. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very surprised that it was a Bibio, and I went down a very deep rabbit hole <laughs> of discovering your work and discovering you, and I did go see the play, and I just really wanted to say that it was one of the most beautiful experiences I've ever had. Um, especially as an Abibio woman when this history is not very much covered um, and is not very much spoken about within the community. Um, it's very healing to see that story being told on stage. And I guess my last question for you would be, um, what was the research um, behind going through this history, knowing that it does have to be held in a delicate way, but more so that even researching it and asking like your parents or your family, it's not something that they would want to talk about um, and something that just isn't very much talked about. Um, going for, for everyone listening, um, Ime is right. Uh, most of the time when you see Nigerian works, you're seeing Yoruba, you're seeing Igbo. Uh, we are EBBO, and um, there's not a lot of language for us in like a mainstream consumption kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so when you're asking about research into EBBO culture, lands, people, like um, I got a, um, what's it called? A, uh, 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 words are leaving me. I, I, I got access to JSTOR. I paid for a subscription. That's, I, I got a subscription to JSTOR. The words are back. In order for me to start doing uh, real research, I started going to libraries and getting interlibrary loans and having like books zipped to me about our people from other libraries because a lot of the time the people who have written about EBBOs from like a historical, historical, like specifically in and around the war were like missionaries and nuns, mm -hmm. not the people. So it was really difficult to get my hands on work, which then alludes to what you're, you're, you're going into, like what is it like to then to ask the people you come from about these things? Uh, that we don't talk about. Like not too many people talk about war in general. Nobody's talking about the Biafran war. So um, it wasn't 
it wasn't easy per se, because you know that you're walking into the heart of pain when you're asking a certain question. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what I found again is that once I started asking the question, I found people who were like willing to talk. Like my mom told me some of the story and it's, mm -hmm. it's painful, it's hazy, it's not quite all the way together. And then uh, I talked to another man who helped me do translation work and that was painful. And so it was, um, it was tricky, it was hard, it was piecemeal. But I think that's also why it was really important to have work that was EBBO out there so that like there would be more access points because we're here we exist we are like the fourth largest in nigeria i believe but for some reason it feels as if we don't have a lot of um visibility here so uh it was tricky it was not easy to get my hands on information um and the research is still ongoing to this day Thank you so much for answering my question. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for your question. Um, well, we're at 11.15. We did and it. We did it. Thank you, Infiniso. Thank you so much to um, everyone who's with us, who's joined us, who asked questions, who called in. Um, this was just a wonderful morning and I, uh, I am grateful for all of you. Um, and this class will, uh, after today, be available on New York Theater Workshop's website, along with all of our past master classes and fireside chats. So if you want to share it, you want to tune in again, um, you can visit nytw.org to find it and everything um, and all of the um, other classes and conversations that we did this spring and all that there is to come. Um, so I will also make a plug for an upcoming open mic night with NYTW and Poetic Theater Productions, which will be on Thursday, August 27th at 7 p.m. Um, so stay tuned for information about that coming out probably next week, and we hope you'll be able to join us. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for being here. We're going to post a survey in the chat. Um, we'd love to hear from you. Please take a second to share your thoughts. And again, if you are in a position to do so, we hope you'd consider making a donation in honor of this class to the Audre Lorde Project or to NYTW to support ongoing work. So we're gonna post those links again as well. Um, thank you for being here. And Beniso, thank you so much. It is wonderful to be with you. And I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you soon. Bye everybody. Bye.